All right, well, thank you very much for coming. We're going to talk about bacteria today, the good, the bad, and the ugly. As we know, there's good bacteria, bad bacteria, and the bad bacteria that makes you really sick and might kill you, that's pretty ugly. So these are just different shapes and groupings of bacteria. Whenever you hear somebody say they have strep, like streptococcus, that means that it's right here in a line and it's circular. Co coccus or cocci is kind of like a uh, grape. And so it's a round shape. If it's a bacillus or more of a, a tic-tac shape, then uh, that's the bacillus. And streptobacillus is in a line. And if it's in a group, that's called a staph, like staphylococcus up there. Just a little background info for people that don't know about bacteria. Typically 40 million or more bacterial cells in a grain, gram of soil and a million in a milliliter of fresh water. So this is much more than a gram and much more than a milliliter. So in tiny amounts. So these are tiny, tiny little single cell organisms. We have 70 trillion cells and four times that many bacteria. Most of that are rendered harmless by our immune system, which is always boosted by being well adjusted, having a good nervous system, 300% boost in your immune system with the chiropractic adjustment as we know. Antibiotics in 1928, Alexander Fleming found out that uh, bread mold actually killed bacteria. So this is where antibiotics came from. And back in 1945, in his Nobel Prize lecture, he realized that if you don't give a particular bacteria enough of that antibiotic, not sufficient to kill it, then it's going to become res resistant to it and make it even worse. And that is what has happened today, as this shows. 1946, 88% of staph infections were killed by penicillin. Then it went down four years later, it's only 61%. About 30 years later, is only 10%, and now only about 5% of staph infections are killed by penicillin. So then we had to come up with 5 million other kinds of antibiotics, and so it's just gone out of control since then. And the bacteria keep adapting and changing to the uh, antibio antibiotics becoming more and more resistant. So pretty soon, we go, we're going to talk about the MRSA, which is one of the scary ones, that antibiotics, it just kind of laughs at those and says, I'm just, I'll just adapt and change, and it's not going to kill me. So good, E. coli, not good on your steak or in your burger, but good in your stomach. <laughs> e. coli lives in the intestines of animals and people and helps them digest food and produces vitamins. It helps to break down the foods and other bacteria also help to decompose um, dead animals and uh, plants as well. So they're very important. They're kind of like the janitors of the uh, planet to help keep everything nice and keep the life cycle going. This was interesting too. There's a bacteria in Australia that they use to extract gold from the rock. Of course, when it gets extracted, it's not quite that pretty, but just an interesting little trivia tidbit there. And also, as we know with the uh, big oil spills that we have from time to time, they always incorporate bacteria to help to eat up the harmful parts of the oil, which is really nice. And they also use it to process uh, raw sewage as well, which isn't quite as fun to think about, but it's just, yeah, that goes back to one of those things where it helps keep the planet clean and helps to keep the life cycle going. How we use bacteria for yogurt, yogurt, you get good bacteria out of that, for fermentation, for beer and alcohol products, vinegar and certain cheeses as well. That's why when you take antibiotics, you get depleted in the good flora, the good antibiotic or good uh, bacteria in your stomach. You have to eat you some nice probiotics, some yogurt or some cheese. Good staph versus bad staph. Uh, we know that you can get staph infections. I had a friend of mine that got a staph infection in his leg in college. He got out of bed one day, big athletic football guy, got out of bed, couldn't stand up. Found out he had a staph infection in his leg, didn't know how he got it, and they were worried they were gonna actually have to take his leg. And he ended up taking two red shirt years for medical reasons and then came back and ended up having seven years of school paid for at Vanderbilt because he was so sick and almost lost his leg. Real nice guy, it was kind of scary. There's 180 different species of staph that grow on your skin. The staph epidermidis helps prevent the Staphylococcus aureus from getting going crazy, running amok, 
and causing infections. And that's one of the problems with uh, any kind of antibiotic ointment. When you have an, an injury or a rash or a scrape, you put the antibiotic ointment on your skin and that's going to kill the good and the bad bacteria. So you want to keep the good bacteria, so better just to wash off with some water, maybe some soap, and that's it. Or uh, hydrogen peroxide is really good too, just to get extra clean it on the bubbles, help get all the bacteria out of there. And uh, you also have um, acne um, bacteria that will help break down the lipids inside the cells and transport the fatty acids that it breaks down in, onto the skin. And that reduces the pH and prevents the growth of the streptococcus pyogenes, which creates pus, which is unpleasant as well. So this goes back to the antibiotic ointment that I talked about. It kills the good and the bad. You don't want to have that. And they sell, of course, they sell the band-aids now with it already built into the pad. So you need to make sure you avoid those and just be smart and use a little hydrogen peroxide like we used to do back in the day and let it bubble out and it doesn't burn or anything like the iodine used to burn. And so now you just use this. Mercurochrome. Or the mercurochrome burned. Okay. Yeah. yeah it's I'm, I'm a little too young for the mercurochrome, so I don't remember that. No offense. <laughs> And colloidal silver, this is a better alternative than the antibiotic ointment. Um, you can spray it on anything, any healing injury, on burns, and it's going to not have any scarring. You can sterilize anything with it. Um, and also, unlike the antibiotics, the bacteria won't develop any kind of resistance to the colloidal silver. And basically all it is is silver in a suspension of distilled water. And Dr. Bergman recently talked about how to make that yourself. You can make it at home. Bacteria in your eye, the Cornobacterium xerosis is one of the only bacteria that will exist in the high salt content of the tears of your eye and can actually um, withstand the action of the enzymes that are present in the fluid of your eye as well. Because we always get things in our eye, sometimes you'll be riding your bike and you get a bug in your eye or something when you were a kid. And uh, any bacteria that might have been on your eye, these uh, bacteria actually help to fight those off. This is an interesting one, Helicobacter pylori. I wrote a paper about this probably, oh geez, over 20 years ago because that was like the cutting edge, that's what causes ulcers, it burrows down into the lining of your stomach and it's, it's the cause, it's not stress, it's not pizza, it's, it's this bacteria. Well what they found out now is it's actually when the goblet cells aren't functioning properly and that's the cell that secretes mucus into the lining of the stomach, so that way um, it protects it from the acid that's in there, the hydrochloric acid. If there's any kind of dysfunction with that, and it could be from lack of nerve flow to that area or from lack of circulation to that area, then these actually swoop in there to help protect that area by uh, burrowing in and, and trying to keep it safe because there's a like dry spot in the stomach basically, so they're actually beneficial to the stomach. E. coli, you got the nosocomial infections, which is a fancy word for you go to the hospital and you get an infection. Usually it's MRSA in, in the, day, the states nowadays, 29%. Uh, urinary tract infections, 46% are the E. coli, 24% from the surgical sites, and it's the most prominent nosocomial pathogen, but now we've got MRSA, which is a little more prominent as well, so, and it causes severe pneumonia, so basically all that is is when your lungs fill up with blood, or blood, with uh, fluid, so you can't breathe, which is definitely not good. But the real cause of disease is a weakened immune system. The overuse of antibiotics. Um, and antibacterial agents such as the antibacterial uh, lotions and uh, the hand sterilizing things like that and sterilizing food ha have all kinds of problems that are far more wide ranging than we even realize to this day. And But it, we're starting to come around because we're realizing that the more antibiotics we feed the cows and the pigs and the livestock, the more it ends up coming back to us through the food chain because it's all in one cycle. If you're consuming, even if you're not even consuming animals, if you're consuming produce, they also get the same infection, which we're going to talk about in a minute, how that happens. So how to optimize your gut flora? You need to stop consuming sugary foods because bacteria love sugar. And so that's going to make them just go crazy if you're eating sugar. So you need to avoid that. You need to uh, eat healthy, low, uh, healthy diet, low in sugars, grains, and processed foods. And that will cause your good bacteria to flourish and that naturally builds up your, your body's defenses against any bacterial infections. But even if you have a, an extremely low sugar diet or eating all the nice organic vegetables, etc., 
If you take antibiotics, that's going to kill the good and the bad, like we talked about. So then your body doesn't have any natural defenses against, against any foreign invaders. Chlorinated water is a bad thing as well, and a bacterial soap kills the good bacteria on your skin. The staph uh, epi epidermidis that we talked about before, agricultural chemicals, and pollution can also decrease your immune system, therefore negatively influence your gut bacteria. And this is really interesting. Natto, this is fermented soybeans from Japan and they're supposed to be really good to repopulate. It's like yogurt on steroids as far as the, <laughs> the amount of good bacteria you'll get if you can handle this. It's not the most appealing looking item, but it's supposed to be really good. So, uh, and it's good for you, so it depends on if you're eating for, for the effect or for the flavor. And if, you're, if you've been uh, sick, you might want to really boost this up and eat some natto. The bad disease-causing bacteria they can attack the body cells directly and some actually produce toxins. So either way they're destroying or damaging cells within the plant or animal in our case. And the ugly. A lot of, uh, well not a lot, but these conditions here are caused by a few species of bacteria that are pathogenic. We've got cholera, syphilis, anthrax we're all aware of, leprosy, and this little thing called the bubonic plague. It's not, not good, very ugly. And the most common fatal bacterial diseases are respiratory infections, which tuberculosis is one of these, kills about two million people a year in Sub-Saharan Africa. So some of the bacteria enter the body through the intestines, that occurs by eating or drinking contaminated food, and cholera is an example of that from contaminated drinking water. Food poisoning is brought on by eating food contaminated with salmonella or E. coli. I was so fortunate to eat contaminated eggs in Germany when I was over there and got salmonella. And this is a very unpleasant condition to have. I was probably about 265 pounds at the time and I was trying to keep my weight up. It was really hard. I had to eat all the time. And I thought the eggs looked a little greenish, but I didn't, I didn't care. I had to eat trying to gain the weight. Oh, it was, I was sick for about a week and a half and lost about 20 pounds. It was not good. Uh, this is the one that causes the bubonic plague, the Yersinia pestis. It caused millions of deaths in the 14th century in Europe. And they believed it was carried on the fleas that were on rats and other squirrels, rodents, things like that. Listeria, this is one of the recent things in the news today. They've, they've got documented 25 deaths so far, 72 illnesses from cantaloupe that were grown in Jensen Farms. Unfortunately, my wife actually has had listeria, and that's a picture in the middle there of the listeria bacteria itself. And they also had problems with um, romaine lettuce. They had listeria on that as well. The symptoms, they're flu-like symptoms. That's, that's pretty much it, unless it gets into your nervous system and then you can have convulsions and, and more severe symptoms. And the people that have immune systems that, that aren't 100% are, and they're really, really young are usually affected the most by this. And the scary thing about this that we'll talk about, oh, here we go. Flu-like symptoms, fever, muscle aches, diarrhea, nausea, but if it gets into your nervous system, as I said before, it can cause some more severe problems. But uh, even they said even if you have the cantaloupes and you wash them it's not good enough because it can get into the meat of the fruit itself so you just have to throw them away if you got them at uh, Jensen Farms. E. coli, doesn't that look tasty? A little E. coli on your steak and chicken. Study found that Staph aureus, the bacteria that causes most staph infections, was present in the meat and poultry industry grocery stores at unexpectedly high rates over half of those bacteria were resistant to at least three classes of antibiotics. There were 80 brands of beef, chicken, and pork, and turkey, from two dozen grocery stores, and from LA to Washington, D.C., so it, it definitely applies to grocery stores around here. And according to this, the reason that there's so many infections nowadays is that they're using low doses of antibiotics for our livestock which creates an ideal breeding ground for these out of control drug resistant bacteria that moves from the livestock into the humans. And the way it gets into the actual produce is even if you're using organic produce, that you have to use manure for fertilizer for that. And if it's from a cow that is infected, 
then the plant actually can get it through the manure. So it's just a scary little cycle how they all get carried from one to another. So typical, unlike typical staph bacteria, the resistant or MRSA is a serious growing public health problem that we've talked about a second, a second ago. And it's exacting a greater death toll than the modern plague like AIDS, even though we know that we have a different story where it comes to AIDS. So this is how they look at it. MRSA. It's like a superbug. Dun da da superbug. It's much more dangerous because it has become resistant to the broad spectrum antibiotics commonly used, such as methicillin, oxacillin, penicillin, and amoxicillin, to kill it. And in the meat study, they actually detected staph bacteria that are resistant to up to nine different antibiotics. So basically, if you get MRSA, you hope it's not the flesh-eating kind because it will literally start to eat your body and the tissue, and it's, it's just not, not pretty. 70 to 80 percent, actually, up to 84 percent of all antibiotics used in the world are used on our livestock to make sure that they not necessarily get, don't get sick, but that they actually get bigger. They, they can feed them more, and when you eat more, you have more of a chance of developing uh, infection, so they're just like, we'll just pump them full of antibiotics and not worry about what happens after that. So farmers that run concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, they reported that they used a whopping 29 million pounds of antibiotics in 2009 alone. 29 million pounds. That, that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of pills, or shots probably in their case. 70% of hogs and 60%, 64% of the workers that worked with the hogs actually had MRSA infections or tested positive for the MRSA. They might not have an infection yet, but they had it on their body. So, as I said before, they not only embed in the meats, but they get into the produce, cantaloupe, apples, strawberries, just through the, the fertilizer that is used to grow those vegetables and fruits. So even or, eating organically might not be safe for you. So basically you just have to grow all your own stuff. <laughs> That's the only way to really be sure of what you're eating. Yeah, you never know, and, and, and pollution just from the smog in the area, yeah, you never know what you're going to get. So obviously they're very resistant to cutting back on antibiotic use, but in Australia and Denmark they've cut back on it quite a bit and have noticed a drastic reduction in MRSA types of infections in their animals and their workers. So it's, it's another money thing, they're just like, you know, we're just going to keep it the way it is because we actually can make bigger, produce bigger units, so to speak, with the cows and the pigs and such, so they make more money. They don't really care about the health effects. In 2006, there was a study published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases that uh, drug-resistant bacteria among antibiotic-free chicken, they were hard to find. So if you have antibiotic-free range chicken and they don't, aren't taking the antibiotics at all, you have a better chance of having uh, healthier meats and less chance of infection by the drug-resistant bacteria. If you live in the U.S. and you're interested in trying to find some healthier foods, the Weston Price Foundation has chapters all over the world, and many of them are actually connected with buying clubs in which you can easily purchase these types of foods, raw milk, um, and all the healthy meats and vegetables that are, are guaranteed to not be. They have three FDA investigators on site at these places to make sure that everything's nice and, and healthy. I know the FDA were a little sketchy on that, but they're all, they do daily checks to make sure there's not any bacterial boosts or anything living in there that shouldn't be living in there. Digestive enzymes. This is something that Dr. Berman is going to talk about here pretty soon. Um, classified based on their tar target substrates. So proteases and peptidases split the proteins into their amino acids. Uh, amylases are things that break down carbohydrates and you get amylases in your saliva and that's why it breaks down the carbohydrates and starts to taste sweet because it breaks it down into its sugars. Lipases, the ASES at the end, that means it's an enzyme, just to let you know. Uh, splits fat into three fatty acids and a glycerol molecule. And we've got the proteases, peptidases, and nucleases that all break down proteins, amino acids, and nucleotides. So get the rest of the story on digestive enzymes, November 1st, with Dr. Bergman. So today, <laughs> it's a teaser, <laughs> the fall special today, you get an exam, consultation, x-rays, report of findings, adjustment for only $25. And are there any questions?